a working age population equal to France in the next seven years is a is a child of their one child child policy. While India has a more organic um, control of our population, so I would be careful with positioning populations as either curses or as gifts. It's what you do with your population, and can you make them productive? And you know, we've proven that five million people in India can export more software than Saudi Arabia did oil last year, mm -hmm. or. You know, 15 million Indians outside India can send us 100 billion dollars of remittances. So, I, I would just position this more as a productivity problem than a jobs problem. So, interestingly, you're saying don't get into the binary of demographic dividend versus disaster. You're actually suggesting look at issues of productivity. Co-powered by QO, European bath lounges. Let time wait. Good evening. You're watching 6 p.m. Prime here on India Today. I'm Akshita Anandakopal and this evening we're focusing on a documentary that's been released by BBC. It's called India, the Modi Question. It set the cat among the pigeons because part of this documentary or rather the focus of this documentary is on the 2002 Gujarat riots. And they make several claims about Prime Minister Modi, then the Chief Minister, and his role in these riots. The Indian government has had something to say about this. The UK Prime Minister has also spoken out on this. We'll get you details of all the reactions coming in. The headlines first. Massive outrage over BBC documentary on Narendra Modi. Rishi Sunak says he doesn't agree with the characterization in the film. Ministry of External Affairs also slams propaganda. Prime Minister Modi returns to State of War Karnataka for the second time in a week, unveils projects worth over 10,000 crore and mega infra push. <laughs> After Olympic wrestlers hit the streets for the second consecutive day in Jantar Mantar, Sports Ministry meets the wrestlers. Wrestling Federation boss brazen it out amid sensational allegations. Age shames the wrestlers, says protesters have passed their best performance age. <music> sensational allegations of sleazy acts against WFI chief Bridge Bhushan. Wrestler Anshu Malik accuses Bridge Bhushan of staying in the same hotel as women athletes. We're hearing that the Federation president could resign on January 22nd. And Bundy Sanjay breaks his silence on son's slap It says, take action against my son if he's found guilty. Says he's also surrendered before cops. And our top focus is on a BBC documentary on Prime Minister Narendra Modi. It sparked a massive storm and a huge debate, rightly so, over the claims that have been made over the 2002 Gujarat riots. The Ministry of External Affairs has now reacted to all these claims that have been made in the documentary, calling this report as a propaganda piece which is designed to push a discredited narrative. MEA spokesperson Arindam Bakshi said that this report clearly lacks objectivity. The documentary, which is referred to a UK government report on the 2002 riots, has claimed that this report mentions Prime Minister Modi, then the Chief Minister of Gujarat, proactively prevented the police from stopping the riots. There are several question marks, loopholes in this documentary, including the fact that there's no reference to the most recent Supreme Court verdict. The BBC has referred to a report by a team that was led by the then UK Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw. Reacting to a question raised by British MP Imran Hussein on this issue, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also spoke out, saying that his government doesn't agree with the characterization of the report. Not only that, you have a senior Indian diplomat, Kaval Sibyl, who was the foreign secretary during the 2002 riots. He set the record straight, saying that there was clear mischief by the UK mission as they had sent their diplomat to Gujarat and circulated what he called a slanted report to EU envoys. 
He's also said that he'd issued a warning to all missions in Delhi not to interfere in India's internal affairs. Imran Hussain. Fine. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last night the BBC revealed the Foreign Office knew the extent of Narendra Modi's involvement in the Gujarat massacre that paved the way for the persecution of Muslims and other minorities we see in India today, with senior diplomats reporting that the massacre could not have taken place without a climate of impunity created by Modi and that he was, in the FCO's own words, directly responsible for this violence. Given that hundreds were brutally killed and that families across India and the world, including here in the UK, are still without justice, does the Prime Minister agree with his diplomats in the Foreign Office that Modi was directly responsible? And just what more does the Foreign Office know of his involvement in this grave act of ethnic cleansing? Well, Mr Speaker, the UK Government's position on this has been clear and long-standing and, and hasn't changed. Of course, we don't tolerate persecution where it appears anywhere, but I'm not sure I agree at all with the characterisation that the Honourable Gentleman has put forward. We have a High Commission, we have information to that uh, video. Okay, so that is not being screened here. I am repeating again. Um, we think it's a propaganda piece. Our assessment is it's a propaganda piece. Now, how can you say that? I am saying it. We have seen it, and I feel it's a propaganda piece. I don't know what's the perspective. You could say it's not aired here. True. Comments by a former foreign secretary in that, and something about uh, reports that he is referring. Look, it's a, he seems to be referring to some internal UK report. How do I have access to that? And it's a 20-year-old report. Uh, why would I just j jump on it now? And just because Jack Straw says it, how does it lend it Latin, that much legit, uh, legitimacy? I heard words like inquiry and investigation. There's a reason we use the word colonial mindset. We don't use words loosely. Uh, what inquiry? There were diplomats here. Investigation. Are they ruling the country? I, I'm sorry. I do not agree with that characterization. And there, obviously there is an agenda behind it. Um, UK citizens' death. Look, um, if there are deaths here in our country, they're followed by our legal procedure. Whether they took it up in 2002, look, I don't have a ready answer. I wasn't around, and I'll have to check whether it was taken up, uh, whether that's a formality of taken up or not, whether legal systems. But as you very well know, there has been a, a lot of legal process against uh, deaths that have happened uh, during that time. I wouldn't be able to answer whether it was taken up or not without checking the facts on that. Let me bring in Gaurav Savant, who has been tracking the story and tracking all the reactions that have been coming in. Gaurav, good evening. Uh, among all of the questions that are doing the rounds over this film that the BBC has showed, a two-part series on Prime Minister Narendra Modi, they've called it India, the Modi question, whatever that means. The timing of this documentary is what is most suspect here for many. Well, some, some have been asking about the timing and, the, and some of the aspects that are being raised, uh, the questions that are being raised. One, you talk about the 2002 um, uh, Gujarat riots. Is it in context? Is all that context being shown? Uh, there are some complaints that are being made that uh, there is some very clever cut and splice job uh, that's been done in this. Uh, you know, the fact that then Chief Minister of Gujarat, uh, Narendra Modi, sought assistance from neighboring states and that assistance wasn't given. Um, those aspects haven't been taken uh, into consideration is one of the complaints uh, that is being made. Whether that is taken up officially and formally, that remains to be seen. But the fact that they're also talking about Article 370 and, you know, what is their business um, about Article 370? It's, a, it's the Indian Parliament that's taken a step. It's the people of this country uh, who voted members of Parliament and not, uh, you know, as the spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs saying, um, you know, the BBC or the British government does not yeah. dictate to India. The fact that jo Jack Straw, uh, then British Foreign Secretary, is saying, uh, saying mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, they're ordering an inquiry and they've sent a team. What's their locus? What's their locus standi to conduct an inquiry in India? India is not a British colony, Very not true. after 1947. Very true. Gaurav, just stay on with me and do feel free to also ask questions of the two guests, the panelists who are joining us on this broadcast. First of all, let me introduce Ambassador Kaval Sibul, former Foreign Secretary. He was in fact the Foreign Secretary during the riots in 2002 to 2003. Good evening, sir. Absolute pleasure having you with us here on India Today. Also quickly, let me introduce uh, Lord uh, Rami Ranger, Member of the House of Lords in the UK. He's joining us from London. Good afternoon, Lord Rami Ranger. Uh, Ambassador Sibul, if I could begin with you. 
You know, you've put out a very interesting reaction to the fact that the BBC documentary has referred to a UK government report. And you've called it a slanted report. What did you mean by that, sir? Well, you know, when I, after I took over, uh, the British High Commission, uh, High Commission uh, sent uh, one of their officers, I think it was the first secretary, I don't clearly recall, uh, to do an investigation on the spot uh, of what happened during these riots. Um, and then uh, they circulated their findings, their report, uh, to the EU heads of missions. And one of the EU ambassadors close to us, uh, he informed me of this. It was a very negative report, obviously. Um, so I, I took a, took the step uh, to issue, uh, if you like, uh, a kind of a warning uh, to the uh, EU heads of missions and, and the and the diplomatic corps in general, uh, not to interfere in uh, internal affairs. This was totally uncalled for uh, for the. The British High Commission to take upon itself the responsibility to conduct an investigation on the spot uh, on an issue which was uh, very, very sensitive and try to mold the opinion of the European heads of missions in this regard. Um, and I had another occasion when I had uh, uh, a luncheon meeting with the EU heads of mission uh, in uh, Delhi. Uh, I again, uh, at the end of my, it was on India-EU relations in general, and at the end of it, I again uh, cautioned them uh, about uh, not interfering in our internal uh, affairs and making judgments on this issue when it was uh, quite clear that uh, uh, all the uh, inquiries that needed to be done uh, uh, were being were being done, and the issue was being uh, discussed. Uh, by our own uh, people yeah. in the US and elsewhere. So there was no need uh, for a foreign... Ambassador Sibal, if I may, are they allowed to do so? Are diplomats permitted to carry out an investigation uh, and submit reports? Well, you know, uh, you can't stop a, 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 anybody from any embassy to visit any part of India, even if uh, there are problems in that area, because we are a democratic country, we don't stop them. But what really uh, the missions normally do is not to put themselves out in this manner where the host government can view what they do very negatively. Now, I can understand the situation if uh, some uh, British nationals uh, or the British community in India True. was, um, in a sense, being targeted and there was legit legitimate concern to find out what had happened. But this was purely an internal affair. And then, you know, 20 years after that, uh, to make a documentary and quote Jack Straw uh, in this regard, obviously Jack Straw didn't come here physically to inspect anything. They were dependent on the reports uh, from, that they received from the High Commission here. Uh, but, you know, the fact that they have done this uh, documentary 20 years after the event shows that uh, they feel somehow that they must get into uh, these issues here. Uh, because of uh, various things, uh, domestic pressures, their own very large uh, Pakistani origin population and Muslim community. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, you know, they have always taken a very, uh, how should I say, protective view uh, of Pakistan. And today, you can see the Economist and Independent and other British, British media are very anti-Modi, very anti-RSS. And they are raising this issue constantly about uh, the minorities in India, uh, being uh, threatened. In the you know, you've raised, Ambassador Sibyl, some very valid points about whether this is truly an impartial documentary. But the question that I have, sir, following up with what Gaurav also asked you, is the locus standa here and the clear malified intent. But I want to understand from you, sir, because it's been 20 years. Has this report ever been spoken of before? No, you see, this is, this is, uh, this is a on-the-spot sort of a report that... Uh, a foreign diplomat goes and then sends it to his own government and then circulates it within the EU. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of pure uh, diplomatic, uh, uh, how these things are done, uh, it is, it is nothing unusual. I've seen myself in Russia, uh, where when there are some so-called human rights issues locally, I found Western ambassadors actually uh, being very visible in terms of showing their commitment 
uh, on this issue. And if a human rights activist uh, has been killed or whatever else, and there is a funeral that's going to be held, they, many of them go and attend that, knowing that the local government would look upon this very negatively. But you do this when you have, don't have friendly inclinations towards the government, uh, as is the case between UK and the European Union and Russia, okay. which is much more pronounced today. But India being a friendly country, and given the sensitivities of the past, uh, for them to play this kind of a game and try and uh, expose more the fishers and in, in India and try to profit from them and yeah. create a narrative internationally uh, against the present government, this is, this is simply not in consonance with the kind of relations that we want to build and that 30 year and the, and the roadmap that we have built till 2030 and the FTA and other things that we intend to sign. The British press is very negative. It is very harmful True. in terms of uh, what it's doing to our relationship and creating misunderstandings. And I and think, think the government also, uh, Ambassador Sibyl, has sent out a very, very strong statement right now, at least publicly, saying that this is quite clearly propaganda. I just want to highlight that on our screens right now, what we're showing is a protest against the release of this documentary. This was an agitation that happened months ago in October 2022, where several people came together outside the BBC office in London saying, do not release this documentary. It's propaganda. Do not come out with this documentary. You see some of the placards that are being held there saying Hindu lives matter. Half-truths is a big lie. Lord Rami Ranger is also with us, joining us from London. Good afternoon, sir. What do you make of this documentary and the entire narrative around the 2002 riots that's essentially being resurrected from the dead? I think it's a very bad taste. It is scoring your own goal by creating hatred between Hindus and Muslims, they are going to divide the community and divide their country. They will be very bad for the social cohesion. We are one con con uh, community now. We have one king and one country. And therefore, we should not be uh, uh, created any uh, uh, policy which brings these two community at a loghead. The policy of divide and rule worked in India but if you're going to use this, it will damage your own country as well. I think it was in a very bad taste. And the Imran Hussain, who made a false statement in the House of Commons that he had consulted in the Foreign Office, and this is what they said. This is totally lie. We checked, and they said he had never consulted, and nothing was said to him, and there is no such reference in the Foreign Office, and they are going to take issue with the leader. So therefore, this is the hallmark of Pakistani community, Pakistani leadership, they are unable to rise above the rest on merit. India is rising. And what do they do? They just find something negative to feel good. I, I appeal to these guys that they have to rise, like the Indian community has risen, exporting doctor, engineer, scientist, teacher, businessman, and now the Lord Prime Ranger, Minister if I may, so they need you to know, if I, if I, if I could, uh, you know, once again, come back to the documentary for a moment, why is it that you've objected to this documentary? Why have you called it biased? I have called it biased because they have just picked up a couple of guys who were anti-Modi. There is a large community, uh, Muslim community, which voted for uh, Mr. Modi. They love Mr. Modi. Having stopped the triple talaq, you need guts. You need guts to stop this, uh, th uh, uh, the Kashmir, uh, 387, whatever it was, to remove that to make the Kashmiri equal equal to the rest of India and giving them the share of the Indian growth and development. So it is totally biased. I can project picture in a way I want to show. So the BBC was by damaging Indian community or their prime minister, they want to feel good. They're not going to feel good. They're going to unite the Are you the saying that there is an agenda, more. there is a motive, that there is a bigger design behind this? They is the only design is the stupidity. They are scoring own goal. They damage their own country because we are a very hard-working community. We are not in prison as much as the Pakistani community. We do not do grooming of young girls. We do not do ped drug peddling. So they should not antagonize the community which has contributed so much. We employ nearly 5 million British people you know, uh, uh, in our in businesses. So they by insulting a community which is hardworking, positive, progressive, uh, they are now going to... Well, anyway, BBC has lost credibility. It's a biased broadcasting corporation, a uh, Bakwas broadcasting corporation. That kind of name are coming up now. So the BBC was held in a very high esteem at one place, but now 
why don't they go and do a documentary of Tony Blair, who was responsible for 300,000 deaths in Iraq with the false narrative of uh, uh, weapon of mass destruction? Okay. Why don't they investigate on you know grooming gang or, or something like that? To you also said, why policy. don't they do a documentary on history of Winston Churchill? Why is that, sir? Exactly. They should be doing on the famine in Beng Bengal. They should be doing a documentary on the massacre of a Pakistani army of two million Bengalis, and and the women two three hundred thousand were raped. Uh, they should be doing documentary on that. But you know because there are uh, there are thirty to forty labor MP who depend on uh, uh, Pakistani votes because Pakistani votes are the best because they are in ghettos. You know because when Indian do does well, he moves to English area. But, you know, unfortunately, Pakistani, because they have never empowered their women, their leaders are not focused, they're focused on religion. They do not even know that if religion had this power, Bangladesh would still be part of their country. In fact, okay. these people treated Bengali on their race in such an appalling manner that they should be ashamed of themselves. So they you allege that there is an agenda, there's a bias that the BBC shows uh, through this documentary. Uh, very clearly, this is also the stance, uh, Akshita, that's been taken by the government. They've questioned uh, the, the veracity, the timing and the facts in this documentary. All right, let's see how this uh, plays out going forward. But clearly a lot of reactions coming in questioning whether this documentary is truly impartial and unbiased or was it with a clear intent and a motive that is being put out right now, 10 years later. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sybil, as well as Lord Rami Ranger for taking the time out and joining us here on India Today. Thanks to Gaurav as well for joining us from the newsroom. We are going to continue getting you all the reactions that come in on that big story. I'm slipping into a short break. Coming up on the other side, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, while there's a lot of talk about this documentary, is busy on a pole blitz from Karnataka to Maharashtra. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressing huge rallies. We'll get you the highlights. men and women who built Indian industry and the young guns who are shaping tomorrow's India. From storied careers to unicorn dreams. The equity market is a dynamic space that needs sharper insights and perfect timing. What stock, what fund, what to pick and what to sell? How do you make money on the markets? And what are the superior strategies for a winning portfolio? Your questions answered by 30 years of undisputed leadership only at the Market Today Summit. This is as ugly as it gets. If you thought our netas couldn't stoop lower than this, think again. Whether it's BJP or Congress, it's the same low-level political discourse in Karnataka. You've heard of chaddi politics. And now it's stooped to prostitutes and pimp jibes in Karnataka. With elections round the corner, political parties have intensified attacks on each other. And by intensified, we mean downright below-the-belt comments. So how did this ugly political showdown begin? B.K. Hari Prasad, the Congress, called a defector a prostitute and said he's lost all self-respect. After the obvious outrage, he apologized. Not for his language, though. I'd refer to the sex workers who, for their livelihood, they live with dignity. But it has been distorted. If my statement has hurt any sex workers, I regret for the same. In no time came a reply from the Saffron Party, 
ensuring their language too was as lowly as Congress. Hari Prasad, yaad chunaav ne yehi kiya thabandi tha. Naav neerva kiya thabandi the. Jandri the ayi kya hai bandi the. Naak baare ayi kya hai the. Hari Prasad ne yehi kya hai thare. Andre pimba ke linda baron thor na yehi nte thari bhiko naav bhushya pimpoolam the thari bhoga. In no time, the political comments were flowing in. Chief Minister Bomai slammed the grand old party, accusing it of stooping to new lows, but offering no comment on his own party man's comments. It is not worth reacting. It is such a low thing. It is not worth it. The BJP and Congress escalated the fight, pinning the blame on each other over this obscene war of words. They use. Uh, give examples of dogs, and now today, he, uh, Hari Prasad has gone still lower by calling them as prostitutes. He, uh, he is the opposition leader in the upper house. He should realize he needs to be more responsible and matured. What he might have uh, inferred is that these MLS have sold themselves for power and money, and those people who sell themselves, uh, I don't think so. Uh, these MLS deserve any more dignity. With the political temperature soaring, the standard of politics in Karnataka is reaching new lows clearly. Bureau Report, India Today. Let's cut across live this evening to Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who's speaking in Mumbai. Transport system, हम तेजी से लाना चाहते हैं. Hydrogen fuel से जुड़े transport system के लिए भी देश में mission mode पर काम चल रहा है. यही नहीं, हमारे शहरों में कुड़े की waste की जो समस्या है, उसे भी हम नई टेक्नोलॉजी से दूर कर दूर करने के लिए एक के बाद एक कदम उठा रहे हैं वेस्ट टू वेल्थ का बहुत बड़ा अभियान देश में चल रहा है नदियों में गंदा पानी ना मिले इसके लिए वाटर ट्रीटमेंट प्लांट लगाए जा रहे हैं साथियों शहरों के विकास के लिए देश के पास सामर्थ्य की और राजनीति की इच्छा शक्ति की किसी भी चीज की कमी नहीं है लेकिन हमें एक बात और समझनी होगी मुंबई जैसे शहर में प्रोजेक्ट को तब तक तेजी से नहीं उतारा जा सकता जब तक स्थानीय निकाय की प्राथमिकता भी तेज विकास की ना हो जब राज्य में विकास के लिए समर्पित सरकार होती है जब शहरों में सुशासन के लिए समर्पित शासन होता है तभी ये काम तेजी से जमीन पर उतर पाते हैं इसलिए मुंबई के विकास में स्थानीय निकाय की भूमिका बहुत बड़ी है मुंबई के विकास के लिए बजट की कोई कमी नहीं है बस मुंबई के हक का पैसा सही जगह पे लगना चाहिए अगर वो भ्रष्टाचार में लगेगा 
पैसा बैंकों की तिजोरी में बंद पड़ा रहेगा विकास के काम को रोकने की प्रवृत्ति होगी तो फिर मुंबई का भविष्य उज्जवल कैसे होगा मुंबई के लोग यहां के सामान्य जन परेशानियां झेलते रहे ये शहर विकास के लिए तरसता रहे ये स्थिति 21वीं सदी के भारत में कभी भी स्वीकार नहीं हो सकती है और शिवाजी महाराज के महाराष्ट्र में तो कभी नहीं हो सकती है मैं मुंबई के लोगों की हर परेशानी को समझते हुए बहुत बड़ी जिम्मेवारी के साथ इस बात को रख रहा हूं भाजपा की सरकार हो एनडीए की सरकार हो कभी विकास के आगे राजनीति को नहीं आने देती विकास हमारे लिए सबसे बड़ी प्राथमिकता है अपने राजनीतिक स्वार्थ की सिद्धि के लिए भाजपा और एनडीए की सरकारें कभी विकास के कार्यों पर ब्रेक नहीं लगाती लेकिन हमने पहले के समय मुंबई में ऐसा होते बार बार देखा है पीएम स्वनिधि योजना भी इसका एक उदाहरण है हमारे शहरों में रेहड़ी वाले पटरी वाले ठेले वाले ये काम करने वाले साथी जो शहर की अर्थव्यवस्था का अहम हिस्सा है उनके लिए हमने पहली बार योजना चलाई हमने इन छोटे व्यापारियों के लिए बैंकों से सस्ता और बिना गारंटी का ऋण निश्चित किया देश भर में लगभग 35 लाख रेहड़ी पटरी वालों को इसका लाभ मिल चुका है इसके तहत महाराष्ट्र में भी 5 लाख साथियों का ऋण स्वीकृत हो चुके हैं आज भी 1 लाख से अधिक साथियों के बैंक खाते में सीधे पैसे जमा हो गए हैं ये काम बहुत पहले होना चाहिए था क्योंकि सरकार ना होने के Okay so that's the prime minister's address right now happening in Mumbai remember he's inaugurating two metro lines also hugely politically significant because of the timing of it it's ahead of the BMC elections we'll get you all of the highlights of what the prime minister is saying i'm slipping into a very short break coming up on the other side is an exclusive conversation that i had with director Rajkumar Santoshi on his latest film Godse Gandhi Ek Yudh there are questions about whether Godse has been eulogized in the film we'll discuss that in just a bit kar diya hame is Gandhi ne par kya kare Gandhi Another good news for Shah Rukh Khan fans as during the court proceedings at Delhi High Court regarding some changes the makers of SRK's Pathan have now revealed the OTT release date of this much anticipated spy thriller. Aur pata ke bhi laega. The Siddharth Anand directorial will start streaming on Amazon Prime Video on April 25th on the condition that ahead of its release it has to be submitted again to get a recertification by central board of film certification hum ye mission saath mein kar sakte hain so are you in or are you out it also starred dipika padukone and john abraham in key roles and is all set to hit cinemas on january 25th tanto hunted सोल्जर ये नहीं पूछता देश ने उसके लिए क्या किया पूछता है वो देश के लिए क्या कर सकता है एंटरटेनमेंट ब्यूरो इंडिया टुडे जय हिंद गिव अस योर सेंस ऑफ व्हाट्स हैपनिंग इनसाइड चैट ग्रेट टू बी हियर विद यू राहुल यू नो अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल हियर फ्रॉम डिफरेंट पार्ट्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड हैव बीन कंसर्नड अबाउट चाइना 
and of course being our close neighbors uh, we're watching uh, how the situation unravels uh, india because of its excellent vaccine coverage and the herd immunity because we allowed infections uh, uh, to to spread like other countries and didn't have a zero covid policy after the initial lockdowns india along with other countries are in a far better situation um do i fear you know this sort of thing happening in india again like what's happening in china i don't think so because as i mentioned our vaccine has been very effective and the coverage has been very effective um china sadly has not had both of those uh, situations pan out and we just pray and hope that um they solve their issue in fact i was talking to some people to try and offer the western vaccines and indian vaccines to them as boosters so they they can control their hospitalizations and come out of even spreading the infection are the chinese further. interested in your vaccine you know um i've requested to them to put political issues aside and just look at the bigger picture because you know for the world it's important that china comes back also um uh you know and we just wish them the best and a speedy recovery because if you look at supply chain disruptions investments uncertainty people are still a little uncertain to to make investments in this part of the world because of what's happening there but of course given that you've seen the response here india is definitely by far the uh, most reliable and chosen uh, destination for investors and uh, given the choice of course india stands uh, far ahead i started by asking other about what's happening in china because what's happening in china from a health emergency perspective also is potentially one of the biggest opportunities for india as global companies realign their supply chains to what extent do you think at this moment in the way things are is india being able to benefit from the idea that companies need to look beyond china and this china plus one strategy of it i think that's playing out uh, quite favorably for india you know because uh, the uh, aftershocks of what not what just happened in china but also what's happened in ukraine and russia has made uh, organizations global companies look at de-risking supply chains is no longer about cost optimization but about resilience managing risks etc so when they're looking at another place beyond china obviously there are other contenders but india is special because india is not just a source it can also be a market and with the pli schemes and the government uh, trying to do more to attract investments uh, there is certainly a strong case for investments to come into india which you've seen in electronics and traditionally areas where we've not seen so much of investments so i think it's a good time for india